Hi there, my name is Michael Henriksen. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat and I'm here at KubeCon North America 2022 to present from pre-population to disasters, manage and protect the state of Kubert VMs. Okay, this session is for people that want to learn more about Kubert storage, a lot of the guts and details there. Um, maybe you've contributed to Kubert Core in the past and you want to do some storage related work. Um, maybe you're just interested in how it all comes together. Both great reasons. Um, so this session, we'll talk a little bit about general Kubert storage architecture. We'll dig deep into um, a couple specific API flows and integrations, um, not uh, the complete set of flows that we support, but some new and important ones that we've been working on. And lastly, we'll uh, talk about what's coming up, uh, what you should be excited about in the future. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be pumped and ready to make some real meaningful uh, contributions to Kubert storage. Okay, Kubert storage architecture. Okay, so when I am asked to describe Kubert in a couple words. I typically say Kubert is VMs in containers on Kubernetes. And yes, that is a mouthful and probably means nothing to 99.9% .9 of the population. But to tech people, that could mean a lot since those are all kind of loaded terms. So I will limit the scope of, of I think, what is relevant to this uh, presentation. By VMs, I mean QMU KVM virtual machines. Uh, and I also mean VMs with persistent disks. So VMs, you can start stop, start back up again and it picks up where you left off. By containers, I mean, basically nothing special here, just that, you know, containers run processes. And in this case, they're running virtual machine processes, a QMU process. And lastly, uh, since this is on Kubernetes, we're gonna be talking about pods um, and Kubernetes persistence implies persistent volume claims. So we'll be talking about them. Okay, so this is kind of the Kubert storage architecture. Um, on the right is a persistent volume claim with a single file called disk.img. That is a virtual machine disk image. That is what QMU KVM virtual machines expect to boot from. Most of the time they can be given kernels or, or there are other things, but for Kubevert, we, for the most part, you boot from a disk image. So how does that plug into the rest of the architecture here? So when you start the VM, the pod gets created, a pod has a container that runs a vert launcher process. Vert launcher communicates with libvert. Libvert starts QMU, which is basically your VM. And the VM uh, boots up. Um, it has a boot device. Uh, in this case, it is dev VVA. And in there is, you know, presumably a kernel and what looks like a standard Linux file system. And yeah, so according to the guest VM, it just sees this device. Turns out that device is actually this disk.img file on a file system. So pretty simple. I mean, uh, for the most part, um, I think file system PVCs are the most common, and this is what will probably be the most common um, storage configuration. Okay, Kubert also supports block devices, and um, it's not much different. Um, on the right, we have a block PVC. Uh, the data on that block device is simply that disk.img from the previous slide, but written out to the block device. And that block device is uh, made available to the guest VM um, as you know, dev VDA in this case. And yeah, it works very much the same as before. Okay, I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, Bird AOFS. Bird AOFS um, is a great way to share PVC uh, 
persistent volume claims between container and virtual machines. You cannot boot from a Vertigo FS configured persistent volume claim, but it's great for sharing data and it all is accomplished uh, via the magic of Fuse file systems. So in this case, um, we have a plain old persistent volume claim on the right with some files on it. It is made available to the guest VM via Vertigo FS. Um, and that starts Vertigo FSD, which um, starts also the Fuse uh, client in the guest VM. And yeah, so the, basically the uh, Fuse call, the Fuse implementation is pretty simple. Just translate the calls from the guest to the client and mirrors everything. So yeah, it's a great way to share data between um, VMs and containers, uh, no disk image files required. But of course you cannot boot from Fuse. Um, so this VM has a, you know, a regular boot disk as well. Okay, so we're gonna get into some flows, APIs, flows and integrations here. Again, not the complete set of things you can do with Kubert, but just some things we've been working on recently and uh, you know, want to put out there in the world for you guys to use and hopefully enjoy. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, we're skipping day zero, which I guess is planning day because on planning day, you decide to use Kubert and that was a very wise decision in, in my book. Um, and I'm sure the decision you will look on fondly. So let's talk about day one operation for visioning. You want to set up your environment for, you know, maybe you're building an infrastructure as a service and you want to make it really easy to provision new virtual machines. Okay, so first you have to talk about the data volume API if you're talking about persistent virtual machines uh, with Kubert. If you've used Kubert before, you're probably familiar with the data volume API. It basically um, encapsulates two things, um, a PVC definition and the source of a virtual machine disk. When our data volume controller encounters a data volume, it will create a PVC and populate it with the source disk image. Often we use PVC and data volume interchangeably. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's basically it. So if you can look at this data volume definition, we see the source uh, on this left here is a, a, a URL. And we have the PVC definition down here, a 10 gigabyte read write menu block PVC. Here are examples of some other sources. We have a, a registry source, which we'll see later. Um, we have a PVC source, which we'll see later. This is what we call also data volume cloning. This is the most um, efficient way to populate uh, a data volume or PVC, uh, assuming that your storage supports um, snapshots or CSI cloning. Uh, the upload source allows you to upload a disk image from your laptop. The blank source is basically just, um, will create a blank disk that you can mount in your virtual machine and, and create a file system, do whatever you want. Okay, so this is, I'm gonna describe here briefly DIY colon image provisioning. Uh, this was what we kind of initially suggested um, when we rolled out uh, Kubert and CDI. Um, so at the beginning of the pipeline here, we have your CID system, CI CD system pushing out disk images to a registry. Those disk images are getting imported into this golden images namespace. In this case, we have a rel, a Fedora, Ubuntu image. And then uh, the clients um, will create data volumes that refer to um, PVCs in that golden images namespace. So you get that efficient cloning advantage. Um, and it's all pretty nice. You have this catalog and golden images and, and clients can, can um, create their virtual machines from that. And that works well, uh, kind of the first time through, but uh, then some challenges kind of creep up. So, okay, well, how do you keep this golden images namespace uh, current. So the CICD system is, is constantly pushing out um, new images. There are security fixes and you want to make sure that all your clients get the latest uh, image. 
how do you do that? And then um, just the mechanics of how do you do that in a non-disruptive way? You can't just delete these data volumes. What if someone is, is using them as, as a source? Um, so some, some challenges there. And we came up with a solution called the Data Import Cron API. Um, you basically, uh, it will, you point it to a registry source, in this case, this Fedora registry disk demo thing. Um, you give it a schedule, in this case, every hour. And then there's a new thing called a managed data source. So a data source is kind of a sim link for a PVC. Um, so in this case, we have a managed data source named Fedora. Um, and then over here, when you're the consumer of this new API refers to a source ref uh, kind data source in the golden images namespace. So it's not referring to the PVC directly, rather it is referring to this managed data source. So let's see how that works in practice. Um, okay, so we have a, um, the data import cron process down here is watching the container registry. Um, it is configured to go every hour. It is uh, pulling for this Fedora image. Um, every time the container registry is updated, it will create a unique new data volume here and update the data source to point to the newest one. And then the clients, they simply re refer to the data source that they are interested in. Um, you know, in this case, it is we're only showing the Fedora data source. So that solves the two problems. Um, the data import cron is responsible for pulling the registry, and the data source gives us a level of indirection from the data volumes. Okay, so day two, we're going to talk about some of our data protection uh, flows here. Okay, first uh, we'll deal with the VM snapshot and restore API. This is a great way to back up the state of your VM in a cluster. Okay, so the API is pretty simple. It basically just give it a source VM here. In this case, it's VM1. And then in the background, it will do all this stuff. So it works for VMs that are running, VMs that are stopped, um, when VMs are running, I guess the couple things to mention here are these steps uh, number two uh, and four, where our snapshot code will integrate with the QMU guest agent if that is running in your guest VM. And that means uh, you can run uh, basically user-defined backup hooks. Like if you're running on my SQL server, it will, you can configure it to dump tables uh, whatever, you know, any sort of quiescing you want to do in your application. We'll also FS freeze all the mounted file systems. So I'm not going to go through everything here, but uh, essentially once your snapshot is complete, um, you should have a, you can have an application consistent in cluster backup of your VM disks and your VM configuration. Of course, uh, snapshot is <laughs> not very useful um, on its own. So we have a restore API as well. So you basically just give it a target and a source snapshot name, and it will you know, overwrite the existing VM definition and create new PVCs with the appropriate data from the backups. And yeah, you're you're back in business with, uh, so snapshots are a great thing if you're going to you know do a schema change on your database, you can create a snapshot, uh, apply your schema change, make sure everything works well. If it doesn't work, you can restore back to where you were before, things like that. It's really um, great to protect for things like that. But how can you use this? In the, you know, they're not particularly useful in the case of catastrophic failure. If your data center is um, hit by lightning, um, your data is gone. So, and also um, 
the snapshot and restore APIs are kind of a bespoke Qvert thing. How does how does you know any existing tool integrate with that? Um, and yeah, so those are two problems that we've got to solve. Okay, so part of the solution we came up with is the virtual machine snapshot, virtual machine export API. The export API basically works great in conjunction with virtual machine snapshots. So you've made a snapshot, then you can do an export. And what export does is create PVCs from the snapshots in that virtual machine snapshot, creates a pod that has an HTTP server and serves up those disk images. Um, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, for a long time in Kubert, we worked very hard on getting data into the cluster. And we only just recently with this virtual machine export API started getting, being serious about getting data out of the cluster. And yeah, we're doing that by serving up disk images to HTTP servers. Um, the HTTP servers are secured by these tokens down here. So this is just a user defined token. Um, it can be whatever you want. We will also auto generate tokens if necessary. So once the pod is running, um, the virtual machine export status will have, you know, certificate oh, certificates that can be used to um, securely download the data. It will also give you a directory of all the links. So if you have a snapshot that had a, a disk called, you know, test VM Fedora, this is the URL you could use to download that that disk image. And there are a couple different sections here in, in the links. There's external and internal. External um, is set if you have a router or ingress in your cluster. So this is you know, externally addressable. You can download this image from your laptop, from another cluster, from anywhere. Internal is, um, yeah, it's just an internal URL. It will reference the uh, pod service directly. And this is kind of just, a weird example of how you know that URL in the link section is parsed. So in this case, the, it starts off with for export API cluster, which will get you this blue box to the ingress here, and it will the ingress will parse the vert export proxy part and pass everything else here over to vert export proxy. And vert export proxy will parse, you know, namespace, name, whatever, to get you to the vert export server. And then the vert export server in the end will, you know, serve up the data, the final URI here, volumes, fedora, disk.img. So that is kind of how these uh, URL is routed and goes through the system to serve up your um, disk image. At least this is the external link case. So these are some use cases for uh, virtual machine export. Um, disaster recovery is, is a good one. Um, you can create a snapshot and then export the snapshot and stream everything to an object store um, or stream to a registry. Um, it is also a great um, use case for migration. So if you want to migrate your VM from cluster one to cluster two, you can create the export and directly import on cluster two using those URLs. As we saw earlier, data volume support HTTP import. So you can easily do that. And local sharing is another um, you know, potential use case if, if two users um, want to share disk images in the cluster, you know, from names you know, transfer an image from namespace A to namespace B, but they don't have permission to do the cross namespace uh, uh, work, you can use the API. Okay. And yeah, Valero plugin is, um, Valero, first of all, is a very popular open source Kubernetes backup migration tool. Um, it will basically back up your uh, resource configuration, you know, your YAMLs to an object store. It will also um, back up your, your PVC disks in a, a number of different ways, either through 
you know, if you're in a cloud provider, it will use the cloud provider snapshots or it can use volume snapshots or it can use uh, Rustic. Anyway, it's very uh, configurable and um, very popular. And they have, and it works great with all the built-in resources in Kubernetes, like um, deployments and uh, replica sets, stuff like that. Uh, but it also, you know, it can't uh, understand everything. So it has this plugin architecture and we have a Kubert plugin. Um, and it, the, the plugin kind of serves a couple of different purposes. Um, first, it helps us with the object graph. Um, say a user wants to use Valero and they just say, hey, back up this virtual machine. Well, backing up a virtual machine definition uh, is not going to give you a complete backup. So there are um, accommodations in the, the plugin to basically build up the entire object graph. So given a virtual machine, we want to make sure if that refers to, you know, virtual machine instance type, virtual machine preference, and the data, we want to build up this whole object graph and make sure that it uh, is complete. And then there are also actions that can be performed um, in this plugin architecture. Um, so we want to make sure that if uh, a vert launcher pod you know, the, the pods that are running our QME virtual machines are encountered. We want to make sure that that freeze uh, thaw API guest agent integration that I talked about earlier with snapshots gets executed. We also want to kind of sanitize some resources like data volumes and persistent volume claims. We got some annotations to make sure that um, everything gets restored correctly. Basically, we don't want to repopulate a data volume that has already been populated and overwrite any data. And yeah, there are certain resources that we don't want Valero to restore. So we showed that object graph and part of that is avert launcher pod. We want that in the graph so that the backup hooks get called, but we don't want Valero to recreate that pod. So that we want to skip that on restore. Um, because we want, you know, our controller to create that pod. And similarly, we don't want, uh, if there's a virtual machine that owns a virtual machine instance, we want to create that virtual machine instance as well. So there are some weird rules that we, that we have to make sure get covered um, so that things get ordered and restored correctly. Okay, so that was, concludes the uh, APIs and flows section. Um, and now what, what's coming up? Okay, one of the big things coming up is uh, volume populator support. Basically, volume populators are a community CAP community initiative. Um, you know, we kind of built data volumes initially years ago because there was no volume populator support. Um, and you know, volume populators make it pop make it possible to define in a standard way. You know, what data should um, come with the PVC when it is initially created. And just to show an example here, we have a data volume that has an HTTP URL import. Um, the populator equivalent will have a data source ref field set that refers to. Um, populator.cdi.cuper.io, which would be a new API group, a kind of import. So basically just refers, refers to another custom resource. And um, this is what that custom resource could look like. Um, it's basically what's going on here is your, you know, the data volume has all the information embedded in it to um, for the source. And with populators, that is kind of abstracted out into another resource that can be shared, which is kind of nice. Um, and here's the process for, for population. Um, the big thing here is step one, the external provisioner will ignore any PVC with data source ref set. And then, you know, our set of populated controllers basically take over um, to get the right data on there. And then we rebind um, the PVC that the user, you know, since the external provisioner ignored the PVC, 
our controller is now responsible for binding it back up. So that's what happens in uh, step six here. Okay, so that's volume populators, kind of um, the new kind of cloud, you know, Kubernetes native way of populating PVCs. Um, we'd like to have support for that for all of our existing data volume sources. Okay, so another thing that we're doing uh, pretty soon, we're going to have cdi.cubevert.io move to the one version. Um, but before we did that, um, we wanted to enable this data volume garbage collection, um, which basically, you know, as I said before, we often use data volume and PVC simultaneously, meaning the same thing. Well, it got, it's kind of confusing for people. So we're now offering um, garbage collection ability, similar to how Kubernetes cron jobs or jobs get garbage collected. We're going to allow data volumes to get garbage collected. So once your PVC has been populated and it's got nothing left to do, it will delete itself <laughs> or it will get deleted by our uh, garbage collector. So uh, it is configurable um, on the CDI custom resource. Um, and yeah, since we're moving to V1, we have to finally get rid of the alpha API. Um, here's some other stuff. Um, we're going to be aligning to kubevert releases. Um, currently, CDI is released every three weeks. We're going to be releasing that, changing that to three times a year uh, to be in line with kubevert and staggered somehow with Kubernetes. Um, we're going to move the snapshot API to V1 beta 1. Um, we're going to have a new data volume source and probably a populate a data volume source for volume snapshots, uh, do automatic size detection, um, yeah, and uh, keep expanding upon the VM export API to, you know, be more useful. So, yeah, um, that's what's coming. I hope that is in line with what um, you in the community um, are looking forward to, but, you know, we'd love to hear from you and, uh, We'd love to have more contributions, um, you know, uh, any features uh, that, that you want to implement. We are happy to work with you on that. Um, this is a maintainer session. So, you know, um, yeah, let's, um, we, we really want to be more active with the community on the Kubert storage side. So we're, we're calling on you to, um, yeah, to, to, uh, Let's work together to uh, make CDI and Qbert even better. Any questions? Okay. <laughs>